Having a friend or loved one end their own life is a tragedy not fit for words. It can come as a shock, feel like the world is crashing in, induce guilt for not preventing it, and leave those left behind feeling empty and lifeless. A situation where you'd expect the Catholic Church, those who believe in the resurrection and profess God's mercy, to shine. If only. The sad reality is that for many years, the Church taught that those who took their own life were condemned to hell and thus barred from Christian funerals and pastoral care. What's even worse is that some people still think that this is the Church's teaching. What is the actual Catholic teaching regarding suicide today, and what can we as a Church do to prevent it? This is Catholicism in Focus. In the beginning, God created man and woman in his image, not only giving us life, but making us sacred by our very nature. We didn't cause ourselves into existence, and we've done nothing to earn this special standing. We are special because God made us so. Because of this, it is right to say that our lives, while entrusted to us, do not belong to us alone. God is the source of all life, and so it is not our right to take it away. This is the case, quite obviously, for murder, willfully killing another, but in the eyes of the Church, there's really no difference between taking someone else's life and taking one's own life. Neither are our own possession. Thus, the Catechism teaches, Everyone is responsible for his life before God who has given it to him. It is God who remains the sovereign master of life. We are obliged to accept this life gratefully and preserve it for his honor and the salvation of our souls. We are stewards, not owners, of the life God has entrusted to us. It is not ours to dispose of. This teaching applies to what we'd refer to as suicide, individuals who decide that they do not want to live any longer, but also to euthanasia, handicapped, sick, or dying persons who, because of their suffering, wish to quicken the imminence of death. Thus, an act or omission, which, of itself or by intention, causes death in order to eliminate suffering, constitutes a murder gravely contrary to the dignity of the human person and to the respect due to the living God, his Creator. Really, it doesn't matter if the life ended with the consent of loved ones and under the care of medical professionals, it's still an act against God. No one can make an attempt on the life of an innocent person without opposing God's love for that person. For this reason, the Catholic Church, even today, considers both suicide and euthanasia to be grave sins. And since there's no chance of earthly repentance after such an act, you can see why the Church once concluded that there was no chance of redemption. Today, we must add two important caveats. The first being that there is a significant difference between actively attempting to end a life and not doing everything in one's power to prolong it. The first is a sin, the second is not. While every person is responsible for his or her life and must take ordinary means to preserve it, there is a limit to what can be reasonably expected. As the Catechism teaches, discontinuing medical procedures that are burdensome, dangerous, extraordinary, or disproportionate to the expected outcome can be legitimate. It is the refusal of overzealous treatment. Eating healthy, taking basic medication, and seeking ordinary care is required, even until the very end. But experimental surgeries or costly medications can be turned down even if they would result in someone's death. Further, in the case of terminal illnesses, medications and treatments can be taken to relieve suffering even if they have the unintended consequences of shortening one's life. The goal is to alleviate pain, not cause death. As Catholics, we do not fear death, we simply don't want to be its cause. Second, the fact that we're dealing with grave matter does not necessarily mean that it is a mortal sin, and it most certainly does not automatically result in condemnation. As I discuss at length in this video, for a sin to be a mortal sin, it must deal with grave matter, yes, but must also consist of full knowledge of the consequences of one's actions and complete consent of will. Those who seek suicide are often very well aware of the consequences, but their consent of will comes into question. The Catechism teaches, Grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide. When we consider what someone's mental state must be like to determine that suicide is the best or only option, it's hard to believe that they are acting freely. The weight of their situation hangs so heavily upon them that they can hardly be judged fully responsible for their actions. It's for this reason that the Church, understanding the mercy of God, now teaches, we should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. By ways known to him alone, God can provide the opportunity for salutary repentance. The Church prays for persons who have taken their own lives. God knows the heart and our situations better than we do, and may very well choose to forgive sins and lift burdens even after death. 
who are we to limit God's mercy? For this reason, there is no law or reason to forbid Christian burial in the case of suicide or euthanasia, and no reason to despair for loved ones. We commend the burdened and afflicted to the will of God, and we know that he will do what is right and just. This does not mean, however, that we should ever take this issue lightly or cease doing anything we can to prevent its occurrence. If you are worried about someone in your life, here are three steps you can take. First, make it clear that you are here to support them. Listen with empathy and speak of hope. Those who struggle with mental health and are entertaining thoughts of suicide often feel shame and embarrassment leading to isolation, and so creating a non-judgmental, supportive environment where they know that they are loved is key. Second, speak in no uncertain terms about their situation. Many feel uncomfortable approaching the topic and will want to be indirect, but this is too serious of an issue to worry about being awkward. Experts recommend asking directly, have you ever thought about ending your life? Or are you worried about yourself? Obviously, some may not tell you the truth, but many will. They may have been thinking about this for a while, but haven't known who to talk to or how to bring it up. It may take someone directly intervening from the outside to help them see how lost they are. Finally, help them find the professional care that they need. If they are in immediate danger, call 911 or the Suicide Prevention Hotline and stay with them until help is found. Most of us are not equipped to handle situations like these, but anyone can find someone who is. Even when a situation extends beyond our expertise, we can continue to show support, follow up with conversations, and check in to see if they are getting the help they need. Jesus' command to care for the sick isn't limited to physical ailments. As Christians, we are called to care for the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. Because really, this is a grave matter. While we hope in the mercy of God, and as a church, never condemn someone to hell for the way their life ended, we also don't want to take this situation lightly. Where there is despair, where there is self-loathing, where there is an unwillingness to persist in the midst of suffering, something has very seriously damaged someone's soul. We may not be responsible for what caused this pain and may not have the ability to fix it ourselves, but as people of faith and hope, we must do everything we can to heal those who are broken. Trust in the mercy of God, but seek every bit of help while we can.